This episode goes out to Bob in Rhode Island. Hi there, Megan Robinson here. Welcome back to the Nightblade Epic Podcast. We've recorded this episode ahead of time because we were at Emerald City Comic Con. Future Us is back home now, but they're way too exhausted to make an episode. I'm pretty sure they had a great time, but they'll let you know for sure next week. Now for a heads up. The Nightblade Epic Volume 1 on Kindle will be going on sale for 99 cents on Thursday. Volume 1 is an epic three-book bundle containing Nightblade, as well as the next two books in the series, Mystic and Darkfire. There's also more than 50 extra pages of addenda, containing more lore and history about the world of Underrealm. The volumes are the best possible way to read the books of Underrealm, and you'll never pay a lower price for this one. So make sure to head to the Amazon Kindle store this Thursday and buy your copy. And there's a link in the show notes to help you find it. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting chapters 12 and 13 of Nightblade, as Lauren tries to find some way to escape the merchant caravan. Enjoy! Nightblade, Chapter 12 From that moment on, Lauren watched for an opportunity to escape. But Gregor hounded her like a shadow, never out of sight. It seemed that Damaris did not trust Lauren after all, despite her kind manner. Lauren's only solitude came when she went to the woods to make water. Then Gregor let her leave his sight. The first time, she kept going into the woods, hoping to fade away and leave him behind. But she had only gone a few yards when she saw one of Gregor's guards between the trunks, eyes fixed upon her. They traveled south through the day, and Lauren's mind raced to determine what Damaris could want from her. She could think of nothing. Once they stopped for the night, Annis appeared as if from nowhere. Her manner seemed airy, light, unreal. Unpleasant that business this morning, would you not say? Lauren paid the question no mind, hoping to ignore the girl altogether. Still, we made good time, Annis went on. And at least you need not fear my mother turning you into the constables for a bounty. I think we have well moved beyond such distrust. Lauren looked over her shoulder. Gregor still stood nearby. He did not react to her gaze, keeping his stony eyes trained forwards. What do you want? Lauren hissed. Want? Why, whatever do you mean? Leave me alone, said Lauren, putting as much venom in her tone as she could. I wish nothing to do with you. Lauren stalked off into the night, looking for a place to lay her head. Mercifully, Annis let her go. At last, Lauren found a spot on the open ground, with guards in plain sight but at a distance, and laid her head upon a mound of dirt. It took her a long while before she could fall asleep, and during the night she woke often to terrifying dreams of a sword in her chest. The next day turned bleak, with heavy gray clouds covering the sky like a blanket. Unusual weather for summer, thought Lauren. The thought came dead and hollow from a distant part of her mind. A forester's daughter should heed the change in weather, but she could not find it in herself to care. Ennis left her alone as they traveled, but after another day's slow journey, the girl reappeared. This time she simply sat, without invitation or request, plopping down beside the tidy fire. Lauren wanted to snap at her, to shout, to tell her to get away, but she dared not. What if Annis took insult? Would Damaris have Lauren killed and dragged off to the woods to join the constable in feeding the forest floor? So Lauren listened as Annis chattered nonsensically about this and that and the road she had traveled since leaving the High King's seat. Before long, Lauren wanted to shake the girl until her silly head came off. The evening wore on and on, and still Anna showed no signs of slowing her speech. As the sun's last light faded on the horizon, and Lauren thought of sleep, Anna scooted closer and grasped her wrist with a smile. "'Might you tell me another tale of Mennet? He sounded a wondrous man, and I wager you know more of him than just what you told me.' Lauren hesitated. She had no wish to tell a story, 
but anything seemed preferable to listening to Annis's babbling. And mayhap a story of Mennet would calm Lauren's mind. She felt ragged after a day of looking over her shoulder, wondering always if each moment might be her last. Lauren knew one thing above all else. She must escape, and as soon as possible. Damaris must have something planned for her, and Lauren had no wish to learn of the scheme. She would find some escape, and meanwhile she must bide her time. The fire had burned low. Pushing up to her knees and finding more wood for the flame, Lauren thought at last of a tale. "'Shall I tell you of the time Mennet bent iron with cloth?' Annis looked at her askance. "'You must jest. Cloth cannot best iron.' Lauren fanned the flames, watching as the orange glow painted Annis's chubby features. But best it he did. One day Mennet found himself within a king's dungeon. The king knew of Mennet's cloak of shadow, and thus he bade his jailer to line every inch of the wall with torches. Without darkness to hide him, Mennet's escape seemed hopeless. Annis sat forwards. They trapped Mennet? Trapped, yes, but not for long. Mennet had many years ahead of him as the greatest thief in the land, and he would not let a wizard king stay him. Mayhap Lauren imagined it, but she thought a sharp breeze gusted. The tongues of flame danced for the moment. Both girls shuddered. "'A wizard king?' said Annis, her voice cracking. "'Yes. They still ruled in those days, many years and more before Andriana the Fearless outlawed them.' Lauren reached into her bag to gather her supper. But how could Mennet hope to stand against a wizard king? They held a dark power, or so my tutors have taught me. They taught you well, but a dark power is nothing next to the power of darkness itself. And so they kept Mennet bathed in light. He inspected every corner of his cell, but the iron bars held firm. He could find no loose stone or crumbling mortar to aid his escape. Annis remained perfectly quiet, only leaning back to wrap her arms around her knees. Lauren paused for a moment to let the words sink in before she went on. The wizard king laughed to see Mennet search so earnestly for a way out. At last Mennet grew thirsty and begged a pitcher of water. The wizard king... What was his name? Lauren frowned. Whose? The wizard king. He was... Lauren thought hard, but not for the life of her could she remember. Bracken told me once, but I cannot recall. Why did the Wizard King not just kill Mennet? Why hold him prisoner if he did not mean to kill him? And if he meant to kill him, why not do so at once? Lauren gave an exasperated snort. If he killed him, how could he go on to become the most famed thief in all the land? Annis folded her arms, stubborn. Why would the Wizard King care about that? He should have killed him. I would have killed him. Lauren saw Damaris standing there above the corpses by the wagons. Fear formed like a white-hot stone in her gut. Yes, Annis might have killed Mennet. The apple rarely fell far from the roots of its tree. She pressed on. The Wizard King granted Mennet's request. His guards fetched a pitcher of water and a wooden cup to drink with. Mennet drank a deep gulp of the water and curled up in the corner of his cell, wrapping his arms around himself as though taken by a chill. The Wizard King soon left, bored by his new plaything. Once he was alone, Mennet rose in silence. He pulled the tunic from his back and tied it around two of the iron bars that held him in his cell. Then he took one of his boots, made from hard leather, and pushed it through the tunic. He seized both sides of the boot and twisted as hard as he could. Round and round he turned the boot until the tunic strained at the iron bars. The fabric stretched, but it did not break. Finally, the iron bars bent under the strain, just enough for Mennet to slip through. He donned his tunic again and slipped out the door. Annis sat dumbfounded. Can cloth truly bend iron this way? Would I lie to you? A small smile played across Lauren's lips. Yes, yes, I would, and I have. She felt no obligation to tell Annis everything. Let the girl feel the frustration of hearing a bad tale. Annis shook her head. No, I cannot believe it. Else how could any prison hold its captives? Lauren shrugged. Believe it or not, as you will, I tell only an old tale. What value has an old tale without a kernel of the truth? 
what else are stories for? Annis folded her arms, pouting. Lauren had tired of her little performance. I am sorry to have disappointed you, but now I must away. I have had much water as I walked, and it begs leave of my company. I shall accompany you, said Annis, leaping to her feet. You? What happened to refine society where we must hide our bodies away? Annis shrugged. It grows dark, and we may take turns. Lauren grimaced, but she could do nothing. Together they tramped towards the trees, Gregor shadowing their footsteps. Once they had passed between the first two trunks, Annis turned to look at the captain. You have come far enough, she said. Gregor did not blink. Your lady mother commands me, Annis, not you. And what will my mother think if I tell her that you leered at me like a lecher when I went to relieve myself? Gregor did not reply or move a muscle, but when Annis turned and walked on, he followed a bit farther back. When they stopped, he fell out of sight. But he did not fool Lauren. She knew Gregor's men lurked all around them. She gave a grumbling sigh and prepared to do her business. "'We must speak, and quickly,' hissed Annis. "'And for the love of decency, do not do that while I stand here.' Her urgent tone drew Lauren's attention. "'What must we speak of?' "'You are in danger as long as you stay here.' Lauren snorted a grim laugh. "'You bring me no news. Your mother seems to see little value in any life, much less my own.' Annis's eyes grew hard. "'I believe my mother keeps you here as a distraction.' "'For what?' "'I have heard her speak with Gretchen in the carriage. If questioned, my mother will tell the city guard that yesterday's constable pursued you north along the road, but if that should fail, they will likely search our wagons.' Then Mother will change her tune. I think she means to trade you in exchange for safe passage into the city. Lauren swallowed hard. It hurt her throat. Why, tell me. Do you think I resemble my mother? whispered Annis, glaring at her. She has fed many men to the underworld, ever since I was a babe. I was raised to think it normal. Then one day I realized the truth, that murder was wrong and outside the king's law. My mother only escapes justice thanks to the depth of our coffers. I have sought escape from her ever since. Lauren could say nothing to that. She knew something of the desperation to escape home. Annis looked into her eyes. A stern, set expression crossed the girl's features. Will you do it then? If I help you escape, will you take me with you? Lauren nodded. I will. I swear it. Nightblade, Chapter 13 As they traveled on the next morning, Damaris emerged from her carriage. Lauren! As soon as she heard the merchant's clear voice, Lauren's heart leaped into her throat. She pictured Annis's face glowing blue in the moonlight. Had it all been a ruse? Mayhap Annis had told her mother everything, and now Damaris summoned Lauren for judgment. But no. If they meant to kill her, they could have done that last night. Gregor could have ended her in an instant at any time. While Lauren still lived, she must keep hope. So she quickened her pace to join the merchant. Today, Damaris wore a gown of light green. It hung slimmer than her average garb, though that by no means rendered it plain. Elegant designs like spider webs wound up and down its length, some in gold thread and some in light pink, interlocking to create a varied palette of color. Her hair clung to the top of her head in tight braids worked into a wide bun. But the merchant's beauty no longer impressed Lauren, for she had seen what lay beneath it. Only a fool saw a bear trap wrapped in velvet and still desired to run their hand along it. As Lauren came to her, Damaris took the edge of the black cloak. She ran her fingers along its trim, an eerie smile playing on her lips. It suits you very well. Do you enjoy it? Lauren chose her words carefully. I have often dreamed of a cloak just like it. That was true enough. In Lauren's dreams, Nightblade always wore a cloak of fine black cloth. It will serve well for riding as well as foot travel, said Damaris. Gregor, bring my horse. That took Lauren aback. What did Damaris play at? She mocked Lauren for objecting to the constable's death and then gave her a fine cloak. She put Lauren under guard like a common criminal, and then continued her riding lessons. "'My lady is too kind,' said Lauren, 
hoping Damaris could hear the wryness in her voice, but Damaris only nodded and stepped aside. This time Lauren mounted more easily and sat loose, hands firm on the saddle horn. Gregor mounted his own steed and came forwards to take the reins from his lady. Thus we walked down the road together, as pretty a picture as one could imagine, thought Lauren, the captain, the merchant, and the forester's daughter. It sounded like the name of a song, but Lauren could not smile at the thought. Even being on horseback again could not improve her mood. Damaris had poisoned that dream. "'That dagger at your belt,' said Damaris. "'A fine make, is it not? Gregor, you know of such things.' Gregor did not bother glancing at it. "'A fine make indeed, my lady.' "'I confess my curiosity as to how you came by it,' said Damaris. "'An heirloom, mayhap, passed down from nobler days of your family?' Lauren shrugged. "'I see only a knife, my lady.' "'Oh, no,' said Damaris. No, not only that. To the wise and trained eye, that dagger holds more words than a tome. It speaks of breeding, of artistry. If I did not know better, I would say you had taken it from a corpse. She gave Lauren a sharp glance at that. But, of course, we have seen how abhorrent you find such things. It came from my parents, said Lauren, her voice cool, nonchalant. Where they came by it, I never knew. But when I left home, it passed into my hands. I made a vow to use it honorably. She put a small bite in the last word, hoping to anger Damaris with the dig. But if the merchant noticed, she gave no sign. But that is even more curious. How came simple foresters by such a fine thing? Mayhap my guess of grave robbery falls near the mark, though it may not have been you who did the robbing. Now came Lauren's turn to feel the bite of words well chosen. Her cheeks flushed and she found herself surprised by her anger. What did she care for insults delivered to her parents? In her fifteen years she had harbored far worse thoughts about them in private. Oh, do not take such offense, said Damaris, tossing her head. I jest. And even if your parents acquired the dagger through less than savory means, what of it? I do not know the tale of how my forebears came by their wealth, but I doubt that book is free of darker chapters. Is that why you act the way you do, my lady? Are you only following in the footsteps of your ancestors? Do any of us do any different? I will never be like my parents. So have all children said throughout history. But if they only considered things clearly, they might not see their parents as villains after all. Take Annis, for example. She does not approve of many things I do to ensure her safety. Did she tell you? Lauren felt suddenly glad for years of experience lying to her parents, not a muscle in her face twitched. No, she seemed quite cheerful, in fact, after... after what happened. A farce she puts on to hide her disgust, I fear, said Damaris. Yet I would go to any length for her future, to depths twice as dark as you can imagine. You did it to protect her, then? Would the constable have killed a little girl if he found your cargo? Lauren could not quite keep the bitterness from her voice. Damaris shrugged. Lauren had the urge to kick her. They would have spared her, but safety means more than survival. True safety lies only in plenty, and sometimes not even there. Do you know how long the Nine Lands have had a high king? Lauren frowned at the unexpected change in topic. She thought hard. Two thousands of years. Thirteen hundreds, said Damaris. And the kingdoms have changed mightily in that time. The people who laid the rules of election and first drew our borders would not recognize the lands you and I walk today. Nine royal families there are now, but only one of those families existed when the High King first took his seat, and even that one cannot trace its lineage straight back to Roth. But do you know how long my family has dealt in our unique brand of goods? Lauren did not wish to seem foolish by answering wrong, so she remained silent. Twenty-six hundreds of years. We are the oldest family in the Nine Lands. Vast is our wealth and extensive our power. Kings claim the right to rule, but their right has only ever come from coin. Coin that my family and others like ours control. Even as a lesser scion of my house, I may yet have the ear of anyone in the Nine Lands, save for the High King herself, if I so desire. Lauren's body had grown tense. 
She forced herself to relax and move with the horse. What manner of people had she fallen in with? Do you know that there has never been a merchant's war? said Damaris, again shifting subjects as swiftly as the wind. Neither in name nor in practice. Wars are brutal, messy things, far below our station. Yet kings insist upon fighting them. We are only too happy to lend them the coin to do so. But while we do not go to war, that does not mean we have forgotten the benefit of a swift killing. What death we deal occurs in darkness and silence, the bodies quickly buried and even more quickly forgotten. Many know of it, none acknowledge it. As long as it remains well out of sight, most would sooner ignore it. Thus it has always been, and thus it will always be. Do you understand? Lauren nodded quickly atop the horse, now more frightened than ever. I do, my lady. I doubt it. But one day, you might. Lauren knew it would be better to still her tongue, but she could not avoid one question. My lady, why do you tell me all this? Because, said Damaris, I see precious things in your eyes, child. So much fear and anger, and yet so much wonder. You have suffered greatly, and yet you still believe the world can hold something other than suffering. Who has not felt the same? Girls like yourself are like pure white eagles found in the woods, rarer than elves and twice as sacred, treasures we must preserve at all costs. The flowery words floated in Lauren's mind like a dream. She remembered Annis's words from the night before and tried to find her senses. Damaris sought to flatter her so she could be more easily deceived. She would not fall prey to such a simple scheme. And as she thought on them, Damaris's words touched off a thought in Lauren's mind. Damaris clucked her tongue. Come, try trotting again. Gregor spurred his horse and tugged on Lauren's reins. Both beasts erupted into motion and trotted off together, Lauren clinging to the mount's neck and glancing every so often at the sword on Gregor's belt. That is the truth of this world, she thought. Not flowery words, but a large soldier with a blade at their waist. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R dot com. Today's letter is O. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.